All right, hello everyone and welcome to Angel City's first Paralympian panel, part of the 2021 Angel City Summer Series presented by the Hartford. We've come together to discuss a very important topic, understanding and addressing the inequalities of para sport. We have a phenomenal group with us tonight to share their perspectives and ideas for sustainable change. Before we hand it over to our speakers, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. In a few moments, you'll be prompted to answer a few questions that will help us better understand who our listeners are. Please respond accordingly to ensure this conversation is as productive as possible. This panel discussion will be roughly about one hour with about 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A at the end. Everyone except for the panelists will remain on mute and off video until our Q&A portion of this event. Please save your questions for the end of this session where you'll be able to write it in the chat or click on raise your hand and we will call on you. Another quick Zoom note for our adaptive athletes, please make sure your Zoom name is accurate so we can give you 10 points for attending today's session. Remember every virtual event you attend throughout the summer series will give you 10 points. Each 100 points unlocks Angel City swag and other cool prizes. And you can get even more points by sharing your participating on social media and encouraging your friends and family to join you. Finally, I'd like to thank the Hartford, Bank of California and the United States International Council on Disabilities for supporting tonight's powerful event. Now, I'm proud and excited to pass the mic to tonight's moderator, Dr. Andrea Woodson-Smith. Dr. Woodson-Smith played Division I basketball at James Madison University and then went on to represent Team USA for wheelchair basketball at the 2012 Paralympic Games in London. She's now a professor at North Carolina Central University, and we're honored she's with us tonight. Please take it away, Dr. Woodson-Smith. Thank you, Katie. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here and join you all tonight. It is wonderful to be here with you all to discuss some of the greater inequities the disabled community faces when it comes to access to sport. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists, all of which are headed to Tokyo 2021 later this summer. First, we have Nikki Nieves, who is sitting volleyball Paralympian looking for back-to-back -back gold in Tokyo for her second Paralympic Games. Next, we have Chuck Aoki. He is soon to be a three-time Paralympian in wheelchair rugby. Lex Gillette, this will be Lex's fifth Paralympic Games, and he is a sprinter and a long jumper. He's track and field and is a T11 classification as he is blind. And last but not least, Matt Scott, who is also headed to Tokyo for his fifth Paralympic Games, looking to repeat in gold in wheelchair basketball. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and taking the time out of your busy training schedule to help our community and the entire community understand some of these major issues. But before we get started, I'd like to give each of our panelists a chance to give audio descriptions of themselves as, as well as share their preferred pronouns. And so I'll begin. Uh, my name is Dr. Andrea Woodson-Smith. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm an African-American female with black hair pulled into a ponytail, and I'm wearing a navy blue shirt. Next, we'll, we'll go with Nikki. My name is Nikki Nieves. Um, what else do we say? I am an Afro-Latina female of dark skin um, with pinky coily hair pulled into a ponytail. Next, we'll go to Chuck. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chuck Aoki, a Japanese-American man with a white shirt with some black stripes on the top and a beard that is not as good as Matt Scott's. Next, we have Lex Gillette. Hey everybody, I'm Lex Gillette. I am an African American. I have black hair. I have on a San Antonio Spurs base, or basketball cap. Uh, and I am, I don't know what color my tank top is. Somebody tell me, but <laughs> I just got done training. It's either black or gray, one or two, I believe. 
And um, yeah, and I am a track and field athlete. I have a little bit of scruff on my face, but uh, it's probably not as good as Matt's as Chuck just outlined. All right. And Matt Scott with the nice beard. <laughs> my, my name is Matt Scott. Um, I am a black male uh, with a white shirt on uh, with a with the silhouette of a wheelchair basketball player that just happens to be me. Um, I have a pretty a pretty nice beard apparently <laughs> and um, and my hair is pulled into some sort of a dreadlock ponytail slash it's kind of a mess right now but yeah dreadlocks up here all right thank you all so much for sharing um now i'd like to start with this question this first question when you hear the topic inequalities of para sport what comes to mind thinking of your experiences um, thinking in the realm of social cultural economic status uh, what comes to mind when you hear inequalities of para sport? Let's start with Chuck. Sure. Thanks, Ann, uh, Dr. Woodson Smith. Um, I think for me, you know, concretely, the first challenge that, you know, in inequality in para sport we face is certainly around financial resources, at least in the sport I play, in particular wheelchair rugby. You know, the cost of a wheelchair is, you know, around $5,000 to play at our level. And now there's ways of acquiring cheaper chairs, but I think that um, the financial burden, both on the on the, um, the side of the equipment we use is so specialized and so individualized that it's a real challenge. But I also think that the financial barriers exist beyond that too, because as we know, you know, living with a disability is expensive. You know, a lot of folks may not be able to have reliable transportation. You may have to try to use um, public transportation, which is not always challenging. And so there's a lot of challenges I think broadly speaking uh, financially that then kind of uh, move into some social dimensions as well that are that are really challenging and I think we have to really be focused and thoughtful about when we're considering the inequalities that we ch that we have to deal with as para athletes um, when it comes to para sports. Great, thank you Chuck. Uh, Matt Scott, since you also use um, a wheelchair for your sports, what else can you add to that? That's the that's the first thing that comes to mind as well as economics. Um, I, the, the chairs as, as Chuck you know, so eloquently put is they're, they're very, they're very expensive. Um, a, a court chair is, it's not only expensive, but you won't excel unless you have one. Um, you can't just roll up in your day chair um, and just expect to uh, excel or, 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 or be noticed. I, I think in order to, to perform at the highest level or even to perform at any level, you need this specialized equipment. Um, and not everybody can, can afford that. So that's the first inequality I think of. Great, thank you. Lex, what about you yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I think where my mind goes to first is the, the social aspect. And there's certainly different things that, that I have to take care of on a, you know, from a financial standpoint. Um, but I think from a, from a social perspective, I remember being in high school and it was so easy for say in physical education class, PE class for teachers to say, oh, well, we're shooting baskets today or we're playing dodgeball or jumping rope. Uh, you're, you're, you're blind, you can't, you, know, you can't see anything. So why don't you just sit this one out? Why don't you go to the study hall and get a head start on, on your homework and I think that a lot of that was, you know, it stems with, uh, you know, the teacher is saying that, okay, well, we have this, we have this student who's blind. I have no idea how to assist him, how to interact with him. And it's just much easier for me to, to tell him to, to kind of sit this one out and, and not play with my, my side of peers. And so I stayed in, in public school in mainstream school and I had a, a teacher who basically challenged that thinking and he was like, well, why, why does Lex have to sit on the sidelines? He's, he's blind. There's something wrong with his eyes. He still has his, his hands, his body, his legs. Let's figure out a way to adapt the activities. So since we're shooting baskets, you know, let me, let me take his cane and let me tap the rim. So now he can hear where to shoot the ball and we can, we can assist him. We can figure out different ways to adapt 
the activities. And so I feel like I'm, you know, I, I consider myself fortunate and, and blessed in that regards because I had a teacher like that. I had a teacher who knew about adaptive sports and recreation, but that isn't the case for a lot of our, our um, upcoming athletes and, and youth. They stumble upon the Paralympics or adaptive sports and rec in different ways. And um, to kind of, to, to close out what I was talking about, my teacher basically transformed the landscape of, of that PE class and of, of the entire school and how people looked at me and how um, everyone looked at individuals who had a, had a disability. Great, thank you. So we've heard financial and we've also heard social. Nikki, can you share your experiences and what you feel inequalities of parent sports means to you? Yeah, so definitely, definitely financially. Um, just when it comes to training full time as a para athlete and not being able to get the same financial accolades as some of your other USA counterparts. Um, but one of the biggest ones that sticks out in my head is just access to resources. So, for example, um, I feel that a traditional athlete, um, even if they make it to the high professional level, has the resource to go and train at like their schools and their sports departments and kind of be like taken in to do so. And what we see now is that, you know, a lot of these USA athletes are going to their schools and they're being, they can't, you know, compete for that school because now they're considered professional, but they're still given all of the same resource as an athlete to go and use the weight room and to go and work out in the gym or use the track or whatever they need is given to them. For para-athletes, it is not the same. Um, even speaking from my teammates um, and our perspective, it's almost a fight to just be, have someone agree to give you some gym space or have someone agree to like come and train you because you know, we have all of it at our, at our training center, which, you know, we still have uh, big differences in resource at a training center, but now take yourself out of the training center and go back home. And now it's like, hey, you know, can you work with me? Because I'm not making the big bucks, but I'm trying to work, but I'm still trying to make it to the game. Um, can I have some gym space? Can I have some court time? Uh, can I use the weight room? So I don't know, the biggest thing to me would definitely be resource and availability and you know, like having that support to train to be the best athlete that you can be. Um, and secondly would be the opportunity that are that is given to para athletes. Um, I feel like since I've been in the para world, so since 2011, um, we've come a long way regarding like big companies giving contracts to these athletes and putting them on the forefront um, of their campaign and doing like a whole bunch of just work within social media to really show that these athletes are hardworking athletes instead of, you know, like the sad, inspiring stories, you know? Um, of course, we're, I love to inspire people, but I also want people to be inspired by my grit and my hustle and my hard work. Um, but I definitely feel like even though we've still come a really long way, there's still so much further to go and so much more opportunity that can be given to pair athletes. Right, thank you. Yes. and. On that same note, what are some areas where these available resources and accessibility uh, issues can be improved? How can they be improved to help and assist other adaptive, sport, adaptive athletes who are entering into this sport? Matt, can you go ahead and start with that? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry about that. Yes, how can, how can we improve the availability and make a para sport more accessible? I think awareness is a, is a big thing. Um, aware, and not, not just awareness in, in certain areas, um, awareness in, in, all, in all areas. I think sometimes we need to have outreach in some of these, some of the inner cities and some of the you know, impoverished areas, um, just because um, like when I was growing, I grew up with my disability. Um, I, I was born with it, um, had it you know, ever since I was born. Um, but I didn't start playing wheelchair basketball until I was until I was about 14 uh, because I just didn't know about it. I didn't know about uh, adaptive sports at all. Um, and when I did think of when I did sort of hear about it, it I, I didn't have the right the right thought about it. I didn't realize how competitive it was. It wasn't um, it wasn't 
shown to me at a, at a, at a level that I could understand that it was competitive and it was amazing. You know, I think that the more awareness that there is out there um, and the more outreach that we have in these communities, um, then we can reach, we can reach the people that maybe have like some inequalities as far as, you know, getting, getting to practice and having transportation, um, you know, getting access to equipment and grants and things like that. Because um, if, if people don't know that those things are out there, then, then how can they, they go after it? You know, there's always, you know, there's always going to be, you know, this, these, these kids out there with all this, uh, all this potential. Um, but until somebody shows them the way or gives them the awareness and the, the, the education behind, you know, adaptive sports, how can they reach, reach a level or reach any level of, of adaptive sports? So I just think awareness is a huge thing. Okay, and I'm going to ask you two additional questions in relation to what you just stated. Um, so for your first 14 years, what was your idea of participation in sport? Did you know that you could participate? Did you, did you have an interest in participating? So a lot like Lex was saying, um, I, so I was, I was always into sport. And when I went to school and I entered a gym class, my, my gym teacher were usually like, uh, well, you can't walk, so sit over there or you can go be a, a, a school aide or, or go catch up on your studies or something like that. It's very, very similar to his, uh, to his experience. Um, but I, I, had a, I had a big, big, big desire to compete. Um, I've always loved basketball. So I would play with my able-bodied friends and, and I thought that was like this, this is what I, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play with my able-bodied friends. And I didn't really know about um, adaptive sport or wheelchair basketball. And then when I heard about it, I, I kind of had this negative thought about it. Like it wasn't going to be competitive. Everybody was going to get a hug at the end. And, 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 you know, I just wasn't really for that. I'm always, I've always been a competitor. Um, and I come from a place that competition is, is like, let, you know, let's go. We want to compete at the highest level. All the kids in my area um, made it adaptable for me to, to play. But when I finally, when I finally reached, um, a lo- finally reached wheelchair basketball and realized that, whoa, like these guys really work extremely hard at this. Um, the, the equipment is, is incredible. And it just, just all of, all of these different, um, different things uh, with adaptive sports. I've, I've never left it. Um, it's, this is, you know, uh, this is something that I've truly fell in love with, but had not, had not gotten that opportunity to be, um, to be a part of it. Cause it was so far away from, from where I, where I live. Um, and my, my mother worked full time. I, you know, I had a single mother household. Uh, so it was, it was really tough, you know, as far as transportation and, and things like that are, are concerned. Um, but I was lucky enough to, to have teammates that would come long ways to to drive and come get me um and, and allow me to to be a part of those those practices but not everybody is that fortunate thank you and i'm going to come back to my second question um for all of you all in just a minute um but yes matt scott is competitive we used to play against each other when he was using his everyday chair in fact i made him use his everyday chair to compete against him when we first began okay so chuck same question. Um, how would you, how can we improve or the community improve in making sport more accessible to people who want to participate in parasport? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think, you know, I want to quickly um, really touch on something that Nikki and Lex both said. I thought both of your answers, you know, to the first question were kind of different, but it pointed to the same kind of overarching challenge, which is in society, you know, in our society and our culture, you know, Parasport, disabled sport, however you want to call it, is still sort of seen as a combination of, you know, something for fun that's like, you know, has the Special Olympics type side to it. There's also the competitive, not that anything wrong with Special Olympics, of course, but, you know, it's kind of seen as this mishmash amalgamation that I think people don't really know what to do with um, sometimes. And that leads to challenges socially and culturally that, you know, a, a, a student like Lex shows up and they're kind of like, what do I, you know, quite frankly, they're probably, what do I do with this kid? You know, unfortunately, that's just the reality. I was really, really lucky in my time growing up. Uh, my teachers sort of did what Lex's teacher eventually did, which was, hey, you're going to figure out how to do this. You're going to play. You're going to play football. You're going to do whatever. You know, I remember I still remember in, in middle school, 
you know, I was that my friends found a way for me to play football with them. I like snapped and then I would I blocked or something. You know, we found ways to adapt it. And so I think what can really help broadly speaking in terms of what we're accessing, you know, not getting too down in the nitty gritty concrete left is an overall sort of change in the way society views parasports as not as this sort of like nice thing we're doing for people with disabilities like, oh, we're, you're so lucky to have us helping you, but really is something that's just a concrete part of life, you know, fitness and sports are incredibly important for everyone, you know, able-bodied or disabled. And so I think helping to make that shift culturally and just viewing parasport as just, you know, I use a wheelchair, Naomi Osaka uses a tennis racket, uh, Matt uses a basketball chair, Lex has a guy, you know, whatever it is, it, it's still sport. It's just a slightly, you know, we just do it slightly differently. And I think that largely comes from, you know, panels like this, us talking about it, but also quite frankly, our able-bodied allies really speaking about how impactful pair sport is, you know, like Matt just described, you know, saying this is competitive, high paced sport, you know, and you can, you can achieve it at all levels. You don't have to become, you know, Matt Scott, most of us can't, um, but you know, whatever it takes to kind of get to that, you know, there's an entry point for everyone into sports, but really making sure that people are aware and understand that I think it's super important. You know, like I said, I got kind of lucky and I was seven years old. I just fell into wheelchair sports because a woman, the director of the program yelled at me across the parking lot. And as a seven-year-old kid, I was like, yes, I want to do it. And my mom's like, okay, you're doing it. So, you know, I think I'm, I'm lucky, but I don't want, you know, the, what I think a lot of us would say in our stories, at least, you know, Lex has said this, and I this is an individual is the one who kind of got us into it. And so I'd hope that, you know, we don't have to rely, the next generation of athletes won't have to rely on a single individual who's really amazing. You know, there's, there's a great, that's great, but it can be broader, you know, it can do, it can be a lot of people are aware of adapted sports and can say, Hey, you should check this out, give this a try. And it, you know, just gets people involved earlier and earlier. And I think that, like I said, goes back to the broader social kind of cultural changes that I'd, I'd love to see happen on this country. And I think are happening, you know, I think they are changing. I think he said things have gotten a lot better since 2012, but we still have a long, long way uh, to go. Thank you. Same question for you, Nikki. Um, how, what are some ways that you see that we can improve on the accessibility of entering into Parasport? Yeah, I, for one, definitely think awareness. That's like the biggest thing, because the more people know, the more it can move forward, like paying it forward, you know? Um, and secondly, integration. So um, having Parasports in elementary schools and middle schools and high schools, um, because I feel like the more integrated it is within sport, even in, in the university sector, instead of having para sport in like the kinesiology department, why can't we have it in with sports? Like it's a sport, it's not in kinesiology, like it needs to all be together. Um, but I definitely think it's huge because as corny as it sounds, like grassroots and like children of the future, right? So if we're starting young and we're integrating it and we're normalizing it with them, as they grow older, it just becomes something that's part of society that we're not looking at as like, oh, well, it's a para-athlete or, oh, you know, um, prime example, my high school coach, I was her first adaptive athlete ever. Um, and she was awesome. Like I didn't have any bad experiences with her. She was just like, all right, we're going to figure it out and you'll get it done. Um, and now finally, 14 years later, she has another adaptive athlete that's just like me. Um, but since I've started playing sitting volleyball, she's integrated that into her PE classes because she's a PE teacher. And she's literally asked me like, well, you know, how can I put, you know, wheelchair basketball or wheelchair tennis? And mind you, like I said, now, finally, after 14 years, she has another adaptive athlete. But before that, she didn't have any. So I'm like, it's the second in her like whole teaching career. So it doesn't matter whether you have an adaptive athlete or a traditional athlete, it should be shared to everyone to continue to grow it, to normalize it. So as we go on, it just, it's something that's not even thought of as different. It's just, it's normal to us. It's, oh, it's the sport and then the para sport. Absolutely, I agree. Lex, would you like to chime in yeah, with your experiences? Yep. Um, just to kind of build off of Nikki's point, I think that's really important because I think about my training group right now, and, and I think that integration is important. I think about my training group right now where we have Paralympic hopefuls, Paralympians, Olympic hopefuls, Olympians. And so in the beginning stages, I mean, you know, I don't know, five, six years ago when all of us had come to train together, it might have been 
a different situation where, or a situation where some of the Olympians or Olympic hopefuls might have been, might have been a, little, a lot more timid or just didn't know what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. And, um, and our coach, you know, he, he's just like, all right, well, you, you guys and girls are going to do the same things. Like just because you may be at a loss when it comes to your sight, or just because you might be missing a limb, you're still going to do all of the, the other activities as everyone else. And so it just became this environment where we're just participating in sport, similar to, to Nikki's point. And so I think that that's also really important because I remember one of my, one of my teammates she hosts a, a sports camp in Mississippi each year. And at her sports camp, she had a, a kid who was visually impaired who came out who attended. And now she was able to say, oh, well, one of my training partners, he's blind, just like you. You still can, you know, you can run and you can jump and, and you know, do whatever it is that, that you want to do. And so she assisted him. They became like buddies during that camp. And I thought that was really cool um for that kid to i would imagine that 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 kid has probably had some sort of interaction with someone who's blind but to also have that interaction with someone who's not blind and that person knows that okay well these are the things that you can do just it was just a beautiful like a beautiful moment and um you know i had a big smile on my face when i read that article but um yeah i think that the the integration piece is huge i also think that I think back to when I was was coming up and circling back to the financial piece, I just think that we need more and more resources available, whether that's equipment, whether that is monetary. Um, we just we need a we need as much as possible when it comes to resources. So for someone like myself, my mom didn't drive either. My mom's visually impaired, although she had usable sight. Um, and so she always had to find a way to get me to different programs and get me to my track meets or wrestling matches, et cetera. And so when you think about, when you think about you know, calling up a, a, a cab to come pick you up, that can get really expensive when you have practice and, and competitions every day. Um, but fortunately I ran into some, uh, some programs that, that offered transportation. And so, when I think about other communities, really just identifying your, your population and, and meeting them where they are, figuring out what exactly they need. Maybe if you aren't in a position to provide a transportation service, using the, the example that I just gave, you know, it could be something to, to where you identify a person who lives in a similar a neighborhood who may be heading to whatever this, this program is and they can just swing by and pick you up. Um, so, I just think about all of those things so that the so that kids and, and whoever who wants to participate in sport that they have access to it. And the last thing I want to say, because I've been talking a lot, sorry. Um, the last thing I want to say is um, man, Chuck, I think I heard you say this a while ago, but really just putting more emphasis on like like the competition. I get it. We might be inspiring, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. But I want people to know about how vicious Matt Scott is when it comes to shooting the threes. I want people to know just how like amazing Chuck is when he's on the on the on the rugby pitch. Like how how fast are these athletes going? Like like just pointing out everything where people can literally be like, "Wow, this is like this is absolutely amazing." Like these athletes are are super talented. And and that's it. You just totally you just don't even think about the the disability anymore. It's just purely focused on that 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 performance because at the end of the day, that's I mean, we're all in the business of, of growing the sport, but when the when the time calls, you gotta compete. And I want people to see just how amazing and how mind-boggling some of these performances are. Absolutely. And I think that is one of the crucial areas is being able to show that 
adaptive sports and para sports and para athletes are athletes. Um, and, and to show the physicality and masculinity and the femininity of the sport and of the person themselves is, is very key. Um, I wanna get into a little bit about your experiences uh, getting introduced into the sport and talking about the inequities that may that you may have encountered at the beginning and how that has changed as you have gone through your experiences up to this date. Um, and so, uh, like I said, talk about how you were introduced to the sport and the inequities throughout your career. And let's start with Nikki. I felt that, I felt you looking at me. I'm like, it's gonna come to me first. <laughs> So I got introduced uh, to para sport through college. So I played, I played traditional volleyball almost my entire life. Now I play shooting volleyball. Um, and one of, I'll say like the recruit for everyone to understand had reached out to our, my athletic director at Queens College at the time and was like, hey, you know, we really think she should come and try out to play setting volleyball. And I was a little hesitant and skeptical at first, but I don't know, I, I think after like my third training camp, I was like, you know what, I really like this. I'm gonna stick with it. Especially because I feel like I, not to say that I ever felt like I didn't belong before I played para sport, but it was just a different world for me because now I had under other people that understood what I was going through, um, how I felt, like the different challenges, having only one hand and like trying to block efficiently, trying to pass efficiently. Um, you know, uh, feeling like, am I ever going to be good enough at my sport because I only have one hand? Um, I'm working my tail off. Will it ever be good enough? Um, so I really felt like I found a community that was just like me um, on both sides of the spectrum, needing support and giving support as well. Because then with that, I found like little kids that like were just like me or um, were missing a little more than me. And it was really cool to be able to connect with them and tell them what worked for me and like, I don't know, to be able to just like grow like in this community. I was just, I've been hooked on it. Um, one of the biggest inequities I immediately will think of is just um, when it comes to the value of a gold medal within para sport and within traditional sport. Um, so just, you know, you're out here, you're working hard, you're winning. And of course, I don't play this sport only for the money. Like I love to compete. I hate to lose. Um, I love the feeling of like, man, my team's been working on this for the past however many years. Like we've been trying to beat China for however many years. And when I got on here and we finally beat them and now it's another team. Like I love feeling like our goals are getting accomplished and I'm making my team stronger. However, like money does play a part and I don't like feeling less than. Um, so the biggest battle that always sticks out in my mind is just the battle of equal pay regarding medals. And now finally, we're getting it. Like now people are finally seeing us as equal. And it might, it might not be, and it's not where we need it to be right now. But for me, I was like, man, like, it's been something that's been going on for years. And they're finally putting value on my craft. They're finally putting value on something that like, doesn't come easy like when you think about sport you think every sport needs so many hours so many touches so many whatever it is whether it's a stroke a push in a wheelchair um so many sprints you need a clock so many hours to be able to get to be like to be decent to be considered a professional to have usa think that you're good enough to wear the flag on your chest um and it almost felt like we're doing the same thing. Dare I say it's even harder because now we're trying to find the money to get our chairs mm -hmm. and we're right. trying to find the money to like, you know, rent out a pool if I need a pool to train and I can't work a full-time job. So I'm trying to work as many part-times as I can to save up the money to be able to go compete for three weeks, but still pay my bills. Um, so it's like all of these little things that go into being a para athlete. And then it's like, but I'm not valued that way. Like mm -hmm. just because they have an OLY, I, I'm not getting as much as they are, you know? So for me, it was definitely like being seen as equal. Like now they're valuing my craft and 
there's still so much more fight, but definitely like eye opening to so many other like companies and sponsorships and even trickles down to like schools and programs and access and availability. Uh, definitely like an eye opener for them. And, you know, like they're still kind of hesitant, but now they're like, okay, maybe, you know, mm-hmm. this athlete is pretty serious. Let me, you know, hop on this bandwagon. Um, but definitely, definitely, definitely mine is, will always be like just the medals. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Matt Scott, how did you get introduced into parasport wheelchair basketball? And then talk about the inequities that you have experienced throughout your career. I was getting caught up in Nikki's answer. (laughs) 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 I I, I had like this train of thought and she got so passionate with it. I was just like, "Eh, go, okay. Um, Well, how did I, uh, how did I get started? I was very, very reluctant as I, as I spoke earlier um I heard about wheelchair basketball a couple of times and and I was I just had this reluctancy um but I was I was more encouraged to go by by a doctor um I would go to my doctor's visits and they would see my 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 day chairs would be all tore up you remember my day chair (laughs) (laughs) but but, but my shoe my shoes would be all scuffed up my you know my chairs would be all rough and I was I'm very rough on my wheelchairs and they would just be like, you're, you're so active. You're so, you know, you, you're doing so much. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Um, and they, they encouraged me to go. Well, my closest wheelchair basketball team was in, I, you know, I was in Detroit and this was in Sterling Heights, which is this affluent area that's extremely far away. Um, so I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. I'll try it out um, whenever I can get there. You know, it, it was, it's just very, it's very tough. Uh, very tough for, for my family to get me there and it was <laughs> it's not it's not my area <laughs> so when I when I first um when I first entered it um I went from being the the only only kid in the wheelchair playing basketball on the on the street ball court to now being the only black kid on the on the wheelchair basketball floor um so it was um I've always sort of had these these different you know inequalities just because you know, I go from being different on one end, and then I come to this and to, to wheelchair basketball, where I, where I was very different. Um, which one thing I thought was cool, though, is the national team coach uh, back in two thousand and four, when I was trying to get on my first uh, Paralympic team. Um, not only was he a black man uh, with a disability, but he was also from Detroit. Um, so that was very uh, that was very cool for me to to try to try to reach. Um, and, that, that, that gentleman's name is Mo Phillips, um, and he was my first national team coach, um, which, uh, yeah, he, he gave me a lot of confidence and gave me a lot of things to not only strive for, but, um, you know, just, just he, he, put, he put me on the right path, and that, was, and that was really great. Great. Thank you. Chuck, I know you talked about a, the director got you started with wheelchair rugby or para sports. Can you talk a little bit more about that in your experiences with inequities absolutely yeah and actually she actually got me involved in wheelchair basketball first is my my first sport i grew up playing matt probably remembers this little tiny kid well he probably doesn't remember it anyway um but uh so i grew up playing wheelchair basketball as the first sport i found um i loved it you know i had a lot of success um in high school but then it was in 2004 2005 i saw this movie called murder ball which is a documentary about the 2004 paralympic team and of course, I saw people smashing each other, knocking each other around. And the 15-year-old boy was like, let's play that sport. That looks awesome. Um, and so I, you know, little by little got involved in it, uh, found a team in Minnesota where I'm from, was able to uh, start playing with them. And, you know, what, what Nikki said earlier actually really resonated with me. It was finally I found people who had the same challenges I had because what I have is a disability that I'm uh, affected in all four of my limbs. And to be eligible for rugby, you have to be affected in at least three, usually four. Um, and so it was just awesome to finally have people, you know, I could, like Nikki said, you know, same challenges I had and say, hey, how do you do this? You know, and it goes beyond, at least for us, it goes beyond just sport and it goes into life, you know, in a lot of ways. And like, hey, how do you open like those little resealable cheese packets? It's like, oh, I do it this way. Oh, that's a great idea. You know, and so it's really been, um, it's been amazing for me to, to find uh, such an incredible community of athletes, like I said, with the similar challenges and struggles that I've had and, and be able to feel empowered and just feel like you belong. You know, it's really been incredible. Um, and in terms of inequities, you know, I think what Nikki touched on certainly with, with regards to the financial side has been a challenge at the elite level. 
but sort of on the lower, on the you know more grassroots kind of domestic, um, you know, side of it, I know one of the biggest challenges we've always faced is is finding gym space. You know, to think once again, make you reference earlier too is, you know, when you're trying to have a tournament for wheelchair basketball athletes or wheelchair rugby athletes, you know, they kind of look at you and say, you want to have what sport here? Like, okay, well, you know, maybe we can do it. You know, and, it, and it's just it, it's challenging because it's this outside organization that often has to go find a gym. They have to find a partner and, you know, sometimes you strike up a great relationship and you're able to host a tournament at the same place for 10 years straight. But, you know, for rugby, sometimes we're looking for a new gym every single year uh, for it to host a tournament and even to have practices sometimes, you know, and I'm, I'm sure this is a challenge that's faced across the board, but, you know, this is, it's one of the biggest issues we face, I think, in just on a simple grassroots level, we talk about, you know, how do we get people to practice? How do we do all these things? How do we have practice sometimes? You know, how do we bring people from all over a state, Matt referenced state, you know, he had to go all the way to Sterling Heights in Minnesota. You know, we're a pretty tall state. We have guys who, we have guys who drive two and a half, three hours to go practice with us, you know, in, in our rugby team. And so how do you kind of reconcile these, these really difficult challenges um, in terms of, like I said, it's first, you got to get there, but you have to have a space for people to go in the first place and not every organization has that. And so you know, it, it's such a powerful thing for us to commune together and to come together and be physically in a place, I say, as we're all on Zoom. Um, but, you know, that's a really, pow it's a really powerful thing, you know, especially for folks with disabilities, I think, to be like around someone who's like you, because we spend most of our day with around people who aren't like us, at least physically. And so I think that's something that's really, um, it's, a, it's an inequity, it's a challenge, you know, we, you know, uh, the place we train at, for Rugby, you know, we're lucky Lakeshore Foundation has its own gym, we can go there. You know, and I know most, and I think there's dedicated facilities for a lot of the Paralympic folks, but below that level, you know, it's, it's really a battle sometimes, you know, just like I said, to find somewhere and, you know, you can't just go run at a, at a YMCA or, or a lifetime fitness, you know, if Nikki wants to play, I'm assuming if Nikki wants to play sitting volleyball, she can't just show up and they're not just going to be people. If Matt wants to play, although Matt, Matt's got friends everywhere, so Matt probably can do it, but um, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's just not quite as simple as finding that because right. our athletes are all over and are hidden sometimes, you know, and finding them. I think that's one of the biggest, uh, biggest challenges and inequities that we face. And I unfortunately don't have a super easy, good answer for, but it, you know, the first step in the problem is recognizing it and talking about it. And then we can, um, you know, kind of figure it out from there. Great. Thank you. And Lex, I'm going to finish this question off with you um, on how to improve. How did you, how were you introduced into Parasport and then what inequities have you encountered? Once I had, I lost my sight when I was eight, so I was pretty young. And once I had successfully transitioned from that, my, my mom and a number of other individuals did a lot of research in finding different programs and, and, and resources, et cetera. And, and so I had gotten into adaptive sports and rec at an early age. I learned how to play goalball, which is another Paralympic sport. I learned how to play beat baseball which is an adaptive form of, of baseball for the blind, visually impaired. I, I was also on the wrestling team. My mom's side of the family is the athletic side. So that's where I get, that's where I get the athletic genes from. And initially um, I found track and field when I was in high school, when I was a freshman. So I had a, a teacher of the visually impaired who knew about the Paralympic games and and he had gotten this bright idea about, oh, you know, you're kind of athletic, you might be able to, might be able to do something with this. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I kind of latched on to him. And, and so that's why, you know, when I had mentioned earlier about, I feel like I was, I was very fortunate. Um, you know, I am because I had someone who showed me really, really early in the game versus some of my other teammates who they don't find out about it until it could be in college or even later than that, it could be in their late twenties or early thirties. And I'm pretty sure all of us can agree that uh, athletics is, is certainly, um, father time is undefeated when it comes to athletics. And so um, depending on the sport, um, you know, you, you probably would wanna find out about it, you know, in, the, in their early ages, but um, you know, we certainly have athletes who have gotten in it at all ages and have been successful, but I'm pretty sure you understand where I'm coming from. Um, the inequitable treatment, I would say in high school, I primarily long jumped in high school. And the reason being is because my high school association, for whatever reason, 
didn't want to give me an additional lane to sprint. So in the Paralympics, the blind athletes are designated one lane for themselves and one lane for their guide. Mm -hmm. And they were not willing to give me that additional lane. So um, I was not sprinting in high school. I just competed in, in long jump. And fortunately, that teacher who I mentioned a lot, his name is Brian Whitmer. And I, sorry, I know I'm leaning back. I'm like, I might get out of the view. But um, so no, you're fine. Fortunately, I had him there to, he was an advocate for me when I participated in the long jump. The long jump, I have the, you know, the powder that's on the ground. And so you jump, uh, you run, 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 jump from that, that takeoff area. And the official measures from where your footprint is in the powder, they measure from that toe mark to where you land in the sand. There were a number of times where officials question my teacher question coach Whitmer and was like all right well, what is like what is this for why do, why do we need this this is this is interfering with the other athletes etc cetera, etc cetera. and coach Whitmer was just like oh no we got to do it and he will always show up to the to the competitions with the uh to, with the IPC rule book the track and field rule book this is how it has to happen and so you think about if I hadn't had him there to be an advocate for me and to speak up on my behalf who knows what my what my career would look like right now. Like I literally went to my first games and you know, we started when I was a freshman and and you know right when I when I graduated it was going to the games. Um, and it was all because I had him as a as a as a cheerleader and as a, a very huge advocate in my life. And um, he even took me to a sports education camp up in Kalamazoo, which was specifically for blind and visually impaired hopefuls, Paralympic hopefuls and Paralympians and people who just want to participate in sport. And to Chuck's point, it was really nice having had been in public school all of those times and being around others who could see, um, to be around athletes who were blind and visually impaired, it was like, oh, okay, well, I'm not the only one. And uh, being able to, to you know, participate and, and engage in all of the activities that they had. Um, that was where I really saw like, oh, there's, there's, there's swimming, there's track and field, there's wrestling, there's goalball, there's all of these different sports for people who are blind and visually impaired. And that lit that fire. And so once I had gotten back to North Carolina, it was, all right, well, I wanna join my high school track team and um, you know, see what I can do with this, with this track and field. Uh, with the sport of track and field. So um, the lane situation will probably be the most, uh, like the biggest inequity. Um, I will say one of the challenges in, one of the challenges in Rio for all of the, the athletes who were, who were blind and visually impaired in the long jump specifically in my event, there was a challenge with us being able to hear our guides. So we have our guides who stand at the takeoff board and they're clapping and yelling. And that was one of the challenges while we were participating because there was a lot of crowd noise going on, the PA announcer, et cetera. And usually you can ask the officials to 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 ring whoever they ring and they'll they'll send that uh, signal out like, hey, we need a little silence inside of the stadium because the athletes are having issues with with hearing. And um, that was another that was challenging and and I would identify that as as inequitable treatment we all as blind athletes we need to hear our guys because if we can't then we cannot compete to the best of our abilities everyone else who is competing you know they you know, that's not as important for them and so um, that was one of the challenges that we had to get through in the in the Paralympic space but um, yeah I would say a couple those are Yes. Well, that, that's wonderful that you had a strong advocate um, like that. I think that is something that is imperative when we have, when we look at individuals, especially, you know, youth being in the kinesiology field, we look at bodies and we can tell and determine, you know, the shape of the muscle to determine whether or not you might be an athlete. And when you see that person, if they look like an athlete, provide that opportunity to that person. Um, just like your your uh, 
physical education teacher did, provide that opportunity and, you, and get you going. That was wonderful, that is wonderful. Now we, we kind of hit upon um, talking about the importance of getting into the disabled community or the parasport community and having other peers who are just like ourselves um, and being comfortable and knowing that we are not the only person out here who has a disability. Um, I want you all to speak a, a little bit briefly as we're somewhat running out of time, um, speak briefly on how important is it to have coaches who resemble you um, or if that is an importance. Um, so talk a little bit about that so that those who are getting into adaptive sports um, may have a better understanding, those who are coaches, parents who want to get into coaching, uh, so that way that they have a better understanding of what it means to a para-athlete to be able to come into a sport, um, being comfortable and having someone who is like them um, or not. Let's start with Chuck. Sure, I'll do my best to be brief. Um, I think it's super important uh, to have um, coaches who look like you, role models, bro more broadly speaking, I think is really what's critical. You know, um, my basketball coaches growing up, I had able-bodied and I had um, uh, coaches who used wheelchairs and rugby. I think actually every coach, I've, almost every coach I've had is, has been uh, disabled. And so I, I think it's super impactful um, to have someone who looks like you, who's you know, kind of gone through the same challenges you've gone through and experienced things. But I, you know, I, at the same time, I certainly wouldn't want any, an able-bodied person, you know, a parent or something, you know, I think a lot of parents love to, you know, coach their kids in baseball or basketball or hockey, you know, hockey or whatever. And so I wouldn't want to take that away from any able-bodied parent. I think the, what I would just encourage any parent um, who's in that position to do is say, okay, I want to be involved. How can I also make sure I'm happy, you know, having an equitable voice for someone who is, you know, has, has kind of gone, done what my child's done, been through. I think just finding that space for that is really critical. And that can be as simple as, you know, maybe sometimes zooming in. I know Matt's going to teach a camp in Auburn next week, you know, for a couple of weeks for wheelchair basketball, you know, having that kind of thing going on, I think is really helpful. Um, and then just kind of, you know, putting yourself into that world and saying, I don't know everything. I'm going to learn this, you know, alongside, uh, alongside you. And I think that humbleness uh, can go a long way. Thank you, Matt. So I think, I think some, some of the coach, uh, most of my coaches have been able-bodied individuals. Um, but I think one thing that is important is if they understand the game and they understand how wheelchair basketball works, they understand how the wheelchair works. I think that's, that's quite acceptable. Um, when I, I've also had wheelchair basketball coaches that know standing basketball and they're trying to you know describe all this lateral movement which we can't do um they're trying you know they, they don't understand that you know sometimes there's there's a class one who doesn't have as much function as a class four um and they're expecting this class one to get up and grab a rebound over this you know a, a amputee um which is you know as, as long as they as long as they understand the game i think it's 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 better it's more acceptable but as I mentioned before, one of my first um, national team coaches, um, not only was he an African-American male um, with a disability, but he was also from where I was from. Um, and that, that was hugely impactful for me um, because I, I just saw how people treated him. Um, you know, when he walked into a room, he had this, you know, his, he, he was an amputee. He had this big, bright, uh, big, bright leg with an with American flag on it when he walked in. Everybody just knew that was Mo Phillips, and they treated him with that regard. He was like this athletic, like hegemon, like you know. And I <laughs> and I and I, I saw that, and I was like, man, that that's what I want, you know. So it was it was impactful for me when they kept, when he comes into a room and they're like, hey, Hall of Fame. That's what they would call him all the time. Yeah, I, I wanted to be Hall of Fame. I wanted to. I, I wanted that. And I was just a, a younger kid, so um, it's hugely impactful for me. So I, I guess. I guess to wrap that up, I, I think it is super important to have that sort of representation to have as role models and have as people that can influence you. Um, but I don't think that it's it's necessary for them to have disabilities, um, but they should be able to connect with you in some sort of way. Absolutely. Lex? Awesome. Yes, I think that, Oof. 
so my teacher, uh, Coach Whitmer, he, he was actually visually impaired too. I, I rarely mention that. Um, he, the reason I rarely mention it is because I never really focused on it much. He, although he was visually impaired, he still had usable sight. And I think that that was very, that was very useful. And it, it really helped me a lot because as someone who was young and someone who was blind, having that person there who had a lot of information to offer, he had a lot of, of, of wisdom and, and tips and tricks and things that I was able to learn from him. And given the fact that we were, I was a student in a public school and he was a teacher in a public school, he was also able to see and identify a lot of the, the inequalities and, and inequitable treatment. And so as an athlete, he was advocating for me in, in the sports arena, but he was also advocating for me in, you know, from an academic standpoint as well. And so I think that that was really helpful. Similar to Matt, I don't think that it's a, uh, that you have to have someone of, of that, that capacity, but I do think that in order to, you know, to have the, the, a great experience, um, you know, I would, I would hope that, you know, our youth are, are being exposed to a, a wide range of things, a wide range of people so that they, you know, they have a, a, a full, you know, spectrum of, of sport and, 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 and of life. Great, thank you. And Nikki. Um, just like Matt and Lax, and I think Chuck had mentioned this too, um, I haven't had the privilege yet of having an adaptive coach. Um, the only coach that I had that looked like me um, was literally almost like me, except he was a male. Um, he was also, also an Afro-Latino, which is really cool because I got to see someone that was like me that was coaching um, and that made me feel comfortable because we're in the same world. Um, but I will agree that I don't think that it's absolutely imperative to have an, uh, a limb different coach. I will say though, the understanding of sitting volleyball is very important and the willingness to like sit and learn alongside you to advocate for you and to like grow with you is really important. Um, because even like I said before, my high school coach, like I felt super comfortable with her. I felt super comfortable to like ask her to help me figure something out. I felt super comfortable with her when she was trying to correct me to do something a different way so it could work out. Um, I knew it was always out of love and always for me to perform at my, my very best. And I feel like that's what's really important. Like the genuineness of that coach to want the best for that athlete. Thank you. And I think um, one of the major concepts there with coaches and um, being comfortable is, is the athlete has to be able to trust that coach to be able to have that comfortability and to be able to share those experiences with them. All right, so we're at the end. So I'm gonna ask each of you for a piece of advice. I see in the chat that there's a lot of questions on how, how can we? And we gave a lot of information on advice of what, we can do to improve, but now let's talk about the how. Let's get some, some action items on how can we make some of these things happen. So I'm just gonna give you a couple of, of words that we already talked about, uh, which is educating people, creating available resources, bringing about awareness, uh, removing the social stigma attached to adapted sports and making it seem as though, making it more competitive uh, in nature and then the integration of normalizing uh, adapted sports, para sports into the school systems um, starting at a young age. So with those, how can we make those, um, how can we implement those and make it a better accessible realm for the community? So very briefly, uh, let's go with Lex. Um. I am going to say, uh, you know, for us to not be reluctant to have like the, the, the conversations that might appear to be kind of like sensitive. And when I say that specifically as, as someone who's blind, I run into so many people, no pun intended, who are just so like, uh, like, like, what do I do? Like, how, you know, and, and 
And I can feel that. Like I can feel that energy. And I would much rather, I would much rather that person, you know, come come forth, like ask questions. So, like, tell me about your disability. How can I help? What do I need to do to help? Um, all of those types of things. I, I guarantee that it's you if you come across um, in an appropriate fashion and you're respectful then that, that person who has a disability is going to be forthcoming with the information and give you what you need so that you can help he, she, or whoever. Thank you. Matt? I think especially for at the, at the junior level or kids that are in, in, in schools, high school and, and below, um, I think that if adaptive sports aren't readily available, I think people can check check through those school districts for kids that might need adaptive services. They can just maybe check at, at different schools and say, hey, do you have any, any, you know, any, adaptive, any adaptive kids, any kids that need that sort of outreach? Um, and not just in certain areas, as I said before, maybe get into these, some of these impoverished areas um, and, and not only with the schools, but I mean, in different you know, rehabilitation type hospitals, um, in, in, in those areas, in the impoverished areas, because I, I find that there's, all, there's usually um, adaptive sports um, or adaptive sport resources in more affluent areas, um, especially in major cities. Um, but, if, uh, but some of the impoverished areas, they, it's sort of a, that lack of awareness. But if people just don't, don't forget about those areas and come Come check on them, you know. You know, maybe visit the visit the, the school district and say, hey, you know, if you have any, you know, disabled youth um, that is interested, um, maybe you can check with them and and maybe you know that that could introduce them an avenue to be involved with adaptive sport. Great, thank you, Chuck. Yeah, I think. Um... I think Lex and Matt said it great. So I would just sort of sum it up as be ambassadors and be advocates, you know, and I think that goes true whether, whatever level you're at, you know, if you're an athlete, you know, be an ambassador for your sport and be an ambassador for parasport, you know, talk about it, be, you know, engage people on it. And if you're, um, if you're, you know, a not, a, a not a para athlete, you're in some other position, you know, be an ambassador, be an advocate, like, like Lex has said, you know, that, that, that single person can be such an important voice. You can be that voice for who knows how many youth or, even adults out there, you know, I think that the one thing I want to mention very quickly is I don't want to forget about adults in these situations as well, because, you know, like I said early on, um, athletics and recreation as a part should be a whole life thing. There should be something we do from when we're young all the way up through, you know, our old age. And so I think that being an ambassador and an advocate are really the, the two best things you do, particularly if you're an able-bodied person who, um, who is, you know, kind of always saying, what, what's the best way I can do? Uh, aside from, of course, putting your money where your mouth is, that never hurts as well. There's lots of wonderful organizations <laughs> You know, they can they can do a lot with resources and the more resources they have the, the, the better job they can do thank you and nikki mine is if you're in the position to integrate or you have the power to create a space do so so if whenever you're in a place where you're like oh i can have this adaptive sport with this camp or i can have this exhibition match or you know, I haven't, like for my, myself, I'm like, I have a nonprofit and I do sitting and standing volleyball and everybody plays both. Um, so whenever you're able to like pay it forward and show people and speak out about it, do it. Absolutely. I think that's a great note to end on. Um, definitely for our audience members, um, make sure that you are those advocates for adapted sports and para sports. You know, we, we talk about the how, how do we do this? But we start by the, the conversation, having the conversation, uh, getting into the schools, getting into the medical clinics, starting there to, to get the, the word out, the awareness out um, and to create programs. So I wanna thank you all for providing us with this beautiful and wonderful insight. Uh, this has really been a powerful conversation. Uh, now I'd like to, to open this up for questions from our audience. And if you have those questions, please write your questions in the chat and we will call on you from there. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Katie. Thank you. Thank you guys all so much. It was so amazing to hear all of you guys' stories as well as some great action steps for all of us to support you guys, regardless of if we're disabled or able-bodied. 
um, everyone can definitely do their part to contribute to this movement. So thank you guys for being here. Um, so the first question that we had in the chat was, what is the best way to find access points to adaptive sport in a community knowing that not all cities and towns have availability? I guess whoever wants to hop in anytime. Okay, start, start. <laughs> um, how I found some was literally through Google um, and then through social media. So I'm literally Googling what kind of programs are in my area, whether they be an hour to two hours away. And of course, with that, you usually find some names that pop up. Fortunately, some of those are adaptive athletes and then you find them on social media and it kind of just creates like a spider web of a network. So like this person knows this person, which, you know, works with this club and then there, oh, there's another little program out of, you know, a, a small school that's next to me that I can participate in. So literally just sitting down and doing my Google search and finding these people, reaching out to them and then working my way out from there. I think um, I think the the governing bodies are, are important as well. Um, I play I play for Team USA, which is governed by the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, and they're they're just plugged in all over the nation. So I feel like if you reached out to a, to a governing body, for example, the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, they could plug you into what's what's near. So if you live in Florida, they can they can plug you into your closest city. If you live in Michigan, then they can they can plug you into the nearest program. Um, that's not always the best way to do it, but I think it's a good start. Yeah, and I'll just chime in real quick too. I think I saw in the chat actually someone posted that teamusa.org also has a really good resource for a lot of um, sport, you know, perform in your areas. And, you know, the challenge with, of course, if you're in a kind of remote areas, you may have difficulty accessing it to it. But I think as we've heard throughout this panel, you know, you can find ways to adapt athletes into all kinds of things, whether it's your high school gym class, whether it's a club, there's ways to find it. So being creative and like I said, being an advocate and saying, we're going to not saying, okay, we're going to put you on the side saying, no, we're going to figure this out. And even though you're the only kid with the, in a wheelchair at this school of 50 kids, we're going to find a way for you to be involved in, in our sports in a meaningful way and not just like a, a token type role. I have nothing else to add to that. Awesome, thank you guys. The other question is, how do you all manage the accessibility issues when you're traveling and when you're in other countries? So I'll, I'll jump on that one first. I've, I've lived abroad for, for quite some time and um, have definitely experienced some, some accessibility issue. Um, as far as traveling goes, uh, I mean, you usually have your, your competition chair as a wheelchair basketball player and you have your day, daily wheelchair. Um, you just, sometimes you, you kind of bring it to the airport and cross your fingers or pray or whatever, <laughs> whatever it is uh, and hope that they don't damage your, your equipment. Um, but a lot of us have, have like different wheel bags that we can take our chair, take our like most precious pieces and put them in a, in a different, uh, I guess a different carrier. Um, and then the frames are, are strong enough to, to withstand uh, the travel. Um, just, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a full physical contact sport. So um, them dropping a chair or something like that wouldn't be that big of an issue sometime. I would say that thankfully I have a, a lot of great teammates um, who are, you know, they're able to assist me from gate to gate or on the bus, off the bus those types of things. I have traveled abroad by myself, and I would say that was one of the most, uh, it was very uh, intimidating. <laughs> and um, fortunately, I went to, it was Manchester, so I went to another English speaking area, which was really good. Um, but the reason I say it was a little intimidating is, is because I'm very comfortable traveling domestically and asking for A, B, C, and D. When I traveled to Manchester, it was a similar type of situation where you know, I had to, to basically speak up and, and, and let them know what it was that I needed in terms of accessibility. And, um, and it, was, it, was a good, it was a good experience. So that's why I'm really 
big on, and that's why my my mom and a lot of other people growing up, they were big on, all right, well, you need to, you got to use your words. You got to ask and tell us what you need so that we can help you. All right, you guys ready for the next question? So we have, can you share with us how you're mentally preparing for your competitions to be strong? I feel like the competition needs to mentally prepare for us. <laughs> We're coming, Team USA is coming. <laughs> In all the sports, in all the sports, basketball, rugby, city volleyball, track and field, we're coming. Yeah, I mean, I think at least, you know, yes, I agree with Matt. Um, I think for me, too, you know, it, we're kind of finally in uh, the home stretch, you know, at this time last year, it was like, who knows what is going to happen? Like, are we going to have it? You know, it was, it's crazy. And now. I think at least for our team, you know, we're kind of like those of us who've been around before say, okay, it's go time. You know, like we're just, um, we're going to work, you know, it's time to get that last, that last 1% of improvement in, in these last couple of weeks here before we, before we get on the road. And, you know, every team's different. You know, we watch a lot of game film We're meeting and we're meeting with our lineups constantly, you know, just kind of all these little details to get ironed out so that when we, when we get to Tokyo, it's just, we go play our five games and we, we come home with a gold medal. So. That's, uh, that's the plan over here, at least. I think for us over here is um, just knowing that we can do it. So, like, for example, we kind of, like, we hadn't competed with anybody in over a year, and then we finally got to see Canada two weeks ago, and we just got back from the Netherlands yesterday, um, where we got to pay, play our biggest competition that will be in Rio, our biggest competitors. Um, and I feel like we've come to terms with like, we're gonna like just control what we can control and go into the game strong. Um, but now I feel like since we've gotten to compete and we got a bunch of matches in right before Tokyo, now we're like, all right, cool. Like we're controlling what we can control. We've been working really, really hard um, and we're ready for Tokyo. Like all out, we leave nothing to come home with. Everything's out on the floor, get it done and go home. I would say, you know, as the only uh, athlete on the panel who is an individual sport, if you will, um, I mean, a lot of it is, is, is literally just whenever I'm training right now, kind of putting myself in a space where I got, like, I believe that I'm in Tokyo. I'm, I'm thinking that I'm in Tokyo and treating practice as if this is the competition. And, and the reason that I do that is because as I stay in that space over the next six, seven months, then once it actually happens and you get on the plane, get off of the plane, you fast forward to the competition venue, you step inside of it, then I feel like in a lot of ways, it, it helps you to, to you know, stay calm, if you will. I feel like you know we all probably have a little butterflies at times, but in terms of the experience itself, it's like, all right, well, I've been imagining this for the past six, seven weeks. I've been living in that in that space for the past six, seven weeks and creating these scenes in this movie, if you will. Now that I'm here, let's press play and watch all of these scenes unravel the way I've been seeing them over the over the last six, six, six seven weeks. So um, I saw myself getting gold. Let's go get it. Love it, definitely. We're all rooting you guys on. The next question is, how do you think we can help train more coaches for adaptive sports, especially a greater range of diversity amongst coaches for adaptive sports? I'll take this one. Um, I know that within the National Wheelchair Basketball Association, we are actually working on a coaching education um, course, and that's going to allow coaches to be able to receive information on different types of skills, um, how to run practices, how to be more engaging with their athletes, the appropriate ways to run practices. And I think now um, there are more 
NGBs who are starting to create what's called these American uh, development models uh, that will include a recreation route and an elite route because a lot of times coaches will go in and think that we need to get our players to the elite realm and only coach according to that. Or you may have coaches who are on the other end of that spectrum or continuum who are throwing out the ball and we're going to scrimmage for two hours, but we're not really teaching and developing. Um, and so a lot of, like I said, a lot of the NGBs now are starting to create these models and create training for coaches to be able to have a true understanding of how to work with not only uh, athletes, but adapted athletes so that they know the disability as well as the sport, the function of the body um, and all of that realm and together to be able to create those opportunities for athletes to be able to participate. So those are increasing. Yeah, I'll just I'll just build on what Dr. Woodson Smith says. I think that's great. You know, I think what would be so cool to have exist, and this is kind of what she's talking about, is like a master class, but for you know these adapted sports. You know, I think we've seen with social media, we've seen the power of how well that can effectively teach people, and we can spread messages really quickly. So I think something like that, it'd be really effective. You know, because um, you know it, it's challenging. You know, there's only a handful of in wheelchair rugby, there's only a handful of coaches in the country. You know, and so it's like basketball is a lot bigger, so there's more resources, but finding those ways of of passing that knowledge on, you know, from one level to another, I think is really is from or I should say from one generation to the next is super important. Um, and it is often best conveyed via via video lessons. You know, I think we've seen in the last year how effectively we can convey information via technology. Obviously, the ideal is to have someone in person in front of you, but we can, you know, we can kind of build. And then I think also just, you know, recruiting coaches who really have a passion and want to learn and want to be involved in it um, to the best of our ability. And also at the end of the day, you know, finding ways, organizations, whether it's Angel City, whether it's, you know, all these different places that we've all grown up through, finding ways to put resources towards coaches, you know, so it isn't just the coaches who can afford to take off every, you know, every Friday or whatever to go to practice or, you know, finding ways to, to um, make it more equitable. I think it, it would, is, is a really important step because right now, you know, like I was talking about the basketball team that I played on growing up, the coach who took over, you know, had time to do it. He had free time, you know, he didn't have to work from, you know, nine to five every single day. He could, um, he could make time in the schedule to coach. And so I think finding ways to, to, to get coaches to be able to have some more resources so that it's not such a burden is a, is a big way we can increase the, the diversity um, of coaches as well, which I think is super, uh, super critical and, and important. Yeah, that's great when we talk about sustainable change. Yeah. Go ahead, Nikki, did you have something to add? Um, so like Andrew had said, uh, for sitting volleyball, we're governed by USA Volleyball. And there's a coaching accreditation that goes through within that, but they've added, or they're trying to add some modules for setting volleyball for coaches. But what my coach um, allows is for, let's say I'm out, I'm not at the training site and I have a coach that trains me here. Our practices and our camps are open to coaches to come and sit and watch to see how our camps are run, how our practices are run, um, to talk with some of the coaches. And I think that's really important because I feel like if you see it and you're right in front of it and you're directly like you're having access to like the person who's running all of it and that can really answer your questions, it just makes it easier for them to be like, oh, okay, I understand it and to go back and do it. Um, and because it's just like firsthand instead of like emails, because of course, yeah, it's easy to explain with video and stuff, which is if that's all you have, it's great. But I feel like if they can get in front of the coach or like at the practice or you know, even if it's there, like shagging the balls or like sitting there in like the team meetings and stuff and figuring stuff out. I feel like if they get some kind of experience in it, it helps significantly. That's awesome. So I think we'll go with our final question now. Um, this is actually mostly for Dr. Woodson Smith, but you guys feel free to, to chime in as well. Um, but how have you seen this space change since you retired or for the others since you guys have started getting into the parasport world? I think 
for the most part, I think the number one is there's more visibility of parasport um, in social media, um, broadcasts, you see it more in commercials. Um, you're starting to see, I thought it was very phenomenal that um, during the, the Olympic trials, they also showed the Paralympic trials for track and field at the same time. And I thought that was phenomenal that they were able to do both of those together. Um, but you're starting to see more of that. The financial inequities that we have, those are starting to uh, become less than they were when I started um, and even before I started. And so I think those are the two major components that we're starting to see more of visibility, getting more people involved, uh, whether they are able-bodied, disabled, sports marketing um, is huge, the business aspect of that, um, to be able to venture into those avenues, to be able to say, okay, here's Olympics, and now we're gonna put Paralympics at the grassroots. Parks and Recs are picking up more and more adapted sports uh, with, at an incredible rate. Um, so those programs are starting to become increased, which will lessen that transportation to get to these programs. Because uh, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous that we have to drive two and a half hours to find a program. And so the more and more um, Parks and Rec programs, adaptive sports programs that we can gain across America, the better it will be. But I think, like I said, you know, the visibility is huge when it comes to parasports. People need to see these athletes. They need to see us as athletes. Um, they need to be, we need to be part of the norm. Um, and, that, and that's starting to happen now. How about you guys, since you guys first started getting involved in para sport, what changes have you guys seen? Well, me, me and Lex are both going into our fifth games. Um, and I'm sure he can attest to this, but it, I mean, it, it's just been a completely different um, landscape in terms of exposure, in terms of uh, support, both financially and otherwise. Um, and it's, it's just, it's, it's an entirely different world. Twenty. 2021 and 2004 are just completely different worlds as far as um, where the Paralympic movement uh, is. Um, it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, the, the athletes are, 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 are training in different environments and, and they have different resources and equipment available to them. Um, the, the coaches are better. The, the athletes are better. The support is better now. Um, it's, we, we are, we're, we're taking from what, what we learned from in those in those 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 eras, and um, and just it was just a springboard from there. It's 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 really really sort of taken off now. Yeah, um, I would say that you know everything that Dr. Woodson Smith said. You know, certainly on the on the broadcast side, I was thinking about when we had trials a couple of weeks ago and how much. It was uh, it just gotten so much better in terms of the the commentators and the information that they were delivering to listeners and watchers and actually giving them and giving them specific information as to how our athletes are able to make the team. They need to hit this standard. They need to hit that standard. Oh, this athlete just jumped this distance. This is X number of percentage of their standard that they need to hit to make the team. If they get really close to 100%, then they're going to have a really good shot at making the team. And so I felt like there was a really good, there was so much, it was so much better in terms of them delivering the information and trying to create awareness and understanding as to what was going on and how the uh, athletes were making the team versus just seeing someone run and being like, oh my gosh, that was a fast race. And just leaving it at that, there was a lot more context behind behind the um, the events. And then I will also say, I mean, we have a lot of strong voices now. Um, back in the day, you might have heard one or two people who, who have brought up important issues, but now you have the Chucks of the world. And you have, I think Katie Holloway was up here. I'm not sure if she still is, but 
very strong voice for the para athletes and you have the Nikki's and the, and the maps and everyone else of the world who speak on a lot of these important topics and really try to try to uh, break down some of these barriers. So um, definitely the, 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 the voices I think are really important. All right, thank you guys so much for sharing your experiences and your insight. Um, and then everyone, thank you so much for attending. Thank you to Matt Scott, Lex Gillette, Nikki Nievas, Chuck Aoki, and Dr. Andrea Woodson-Smith for taking the time to help us all better understand and address the inequalities of parasport and also give us action items to go out and be able to make that sustainable change. I'd also like to thank the Hartford Bank of California and, you, and the United States International Council on Disabilities for supporting tonight's powerful event. Matt and Nikki will be back on Thursday for our Team USA training and tactics sessions at 4 and 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then we will host another panel discussion focusing on the veterans transition from the battlefield to the sport field next Tuesday at 5.30 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you all again and have a wonderful night. Take care, everyone.